Once, twice, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Mary Jesus, please tell her. Really? Once, twice, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight? Wow. Mary Jesus, please tell her. This week on this was a thing. This was a thing. Cigarette ads and Disneyland. This was a thing. Deborah and Bert kiss in the sand. Lana Turner kicks the bucket. Elvis Presley starts to sing. Hi, I'm Ray. And I'm Rob. And you're listening to This Was a Thing, the podcast that dives deep into the cultural happenings of yesteryear. On today's episode, we are looking at the seven husbands and eight marriages of silver screen icon Elizabeth Taylor. Wow. Now, may we all be so lucky. This was a thing because there was no other celebrity whose love life before or since that the public and press have been so infatuated by. Sure, there were attempts with Marilyn Monroe and Cher and Brangelina, but nothing compared to the many loves of Elizabeth Taylor. And while Liz's last marriage was over 30 years ago, it was these relationships that gave the press and the public, correct or not, the feeling that they had the right to intrude on every aspect of a celebrity celebrity's personal life, and when you became famous, you lost the right to your humanity and privacy. Well, obviously. That's why so many people are like flocking outside your door, right? Cameras, paparazzi everywhere. Hold on, I'll be right back. I think the shutters are getting on, taking over the mic. Continuing on. In an era when we know everything about a celebrity, either because of TMZ or by their welcoming us into their lives on their social media accounts, it's hard to articulate how private stars were and how controlled they were by a studio system that demanded morality from them. So in order not to upset the movie-going public spending on seeing their stars. I, I imagine what Elizabeth Taylor's uh, Instagram would be like. What would it be like, right? <laughs> These diamonds have always brought me luck. Hashtag ad. Hashtag K Jewelers. <laughs> Hashtag Diamonds. Folks, if you don't know what we're talking about, I, I just I'm gonna play it right now so you know what we're talking about. I'm sorry to jump the gun. No, we're gonna we're gonna play it right now. Folks, this is how most of the people like I think Ray and I's age twenty one know Elizabeth Taylor. It's through this commercial that was literally on all the time. It's uh, Elizabeth Taylor White Diamonds. Here we go. <laughs> always brought me luck white diamonds the intriguing fragrance from elizabeth taylor okay let me be clear folks on what you were seeing if you if you have not seen this commercial it's black and white it was done in the 90s and it's all of these like men playing card games and gambling and liz taylor saunters up to the table and she takes off one of her earrings and just drops it in the pile to the gambler and says these have always brought me luck and then she walks away I'm curious to what else Liz could possibly drop on that table that also brings her luck. A deuce. <laughs> well, I don't want to jump the gun here, but I also think it's ironic that Liz Taylor says these have always brought me luck when I'm pretty sure this episode is <laughs> not really about don't the luck of Liz Taylor. Don't I feel take like that bet. <laughs> I would not be a card shark. If, if Liz Taylor brought a diamond up to me as a card shark and was like, these have always brought me luck, I'd be like, get that fucking thing out of here. <laughs> I've, I've seen you in the press. <laughs> I know you get away from I, me. Yeah, I know you're not that lucky, Liz. <laughs> I just love the fact. What did you say that she just drops a deuce on the table? Yeah. <laughs> Brown diamonds. Brown diamonds by Elizabeth. These have always brought me luck. <laughs> Cut. Liz, are, are, are you defecating? Well, I left my earrings in the trailer, <laughs> and I was taught to always improvise. 
So for those of you <laughs> who are still who are still listening at this point and don't know who Elizabeth Taylor was, well then go to the internet. God damn it! Pause the fucking episode. Why do we have to do all of our work oh for you? My God. She was an actress, and her career spanned from her 1940s childhood all the way through the early 2000s. She did stage. She did screen. She did television. She did commercials. She dropped deuces. She dropped, she dropped deuces in black and white, which was also pretty impressive. And she conquered each of them with her beauty and her grace and this captivating allure of her all of her own. Now, like I said, if you're a millennial, you know from the White Diamonds commercial, maybe her appearances on The Nanny, she always had a great sense of humor about herself, and she always was aware that she should stay one step ahead of the joke. So, as wonderful as an actress as she was, I think you just need to look at Cleopatra and then look at Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf to see the range that this person had. She was consistently objectified by many for her striking beauty, sensuality. And eyes the color of skin. Violet. Oh, violet. You can't see them in the black and white, can you? No. Now, no matter how great her work was in those movies, as well as National Velvet, Giant, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Butterfield 8, her beauty was discussed first, then her acting. Now, as lucky as she was in acting, because, you know, two Oscars, she was quite unlucky in love, as we've talked about. And as a product of the studio system, a system that she entered into when she was a child immigrating over from the UK, Liz's romances at first were kept strictly under the studio's observership. MGM, the studio to which Liz was under contract, loved playing matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. And at 16, she was first paired with West football player Glenn Davis in 1948. <laughs> it doesn't scan. So MGM put her with a guy named Glenn Davis, and he was a West Point football player. Ooh. And our version, I want you to think of Glenn as a young Bradley Cooper. Oh, Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. Keep that in your mind, folks. That relationship doesn't last, which is normal in Hollywood. It's normal for like the young star to like have various different bows on her arm to be seen with. Then in 1949, she goes with a guy named William Pauly Jr. He's an ambassador's son, and they get engaged. Mazel tov. Oh. We're going to think of William Pauly Jr. as Bobby Cannavale. Okay. Okay. But now, he's 28. She's 17. That's um, that's 11 wonderful years between them. It doesn't work because he wanted a wife, and she wanted to make movies, so they split. Now, you might wonder why Liz, so young, wanted to get married. And later on in a Life magazine article, which was like done in 1964, she says she felt that if she got married, she would be out from under the thumb of her parents and the studio if she had married someone. And to her, love was synonymous with marriage. And then finally, here we go. This is what's going to kick it off on May 6th. 1950. Uh-oh, here we go. At age 18, folks, she finally embarks on her first marriage, Miss Taylor does, to Conrad Nicky Hilton Jr. Ooh. And he is 23 years old, and everyone loved Liz and wanted to see Liz get married because she was in so many family-friendly movies. She was like America's sweetheart. And what a family to marry into. Oh, we're going to talk about them. Here's a clip saying how the wedding was the wedding of the year. Hollywood's wedding of the year at the Beverly Hills Catholic Church as lovely British-born screen star Elizabeth Taylor arrives with her father for her marriage to Conrad Hilton Jr., crowning a romance everybody's been interested in. Her striking 1,200-pound gown of white satin with veil to match, a gift from her studio friends, simply stagger the enormous crowds of the wedding. And so a storybook union becomes a reality. The 23-year-old bridegroom is heir to one of America's richest men. Elizabeth, at 18, is famous for her loveliness and charm. And now they're off for the reception. And when Liz Taylor got out of the limo, she fell down to the floor, the 1,200-pound staggering Liz Taylor Hilton. Liz Taylor fell through the streets of Beverly Hills <laughs> because of her giant dress. That's right. Liz Taylor, America's British sweetheart. Sad news out of Hollywood tonight. Conrad Hilton is dead after he tried to live Liz in his 1,200-pound dress <laughs> over the threshold. <laughs> he fell under the weight, collapsed, and died. Sorry, Connie, but what a way to go. <laughs> so, Conrad Hilton, folks is the great uncle of Paris and Nikki Hilton. Nikki was named after him. That's true. And I want you to imagine Conrad as uh, one of them, but just in a fedora <laughs> sending telegrams. <laughs> now, not surprising with the Hilton name, he is probably not the best choice for Liz as he is a drinker, a gambler, 
he's violent, and it also comes out that he had once slept with his stepmother, who was Jaja Gabor. Now, surprise, surprise, Liz realizes after eight months that she's made a mistake, and the marriage ends. Here's Liz talking a little bit about her time with Nikki Hilton. I had no idea that he drank, because we were engaged for nine months, and he was on the wagon that whole time. So two weeks after our marriage, when he started drinking, I had no idea that that person existed. And that's when the reality of the world hit me. And the reality that I was not an adult. And I had to really grow up fast. Abusive. Oh, God, yes. I was uh, a bit of a punching bag. Poor Liz. Wow. Poor Liz. And you have to think back at that time, there was no discussion about how to handle any of this stuff. or And and so, God bless her. So, as a child, she's trying to figure out how to be in a marriage and how to deal with somebody who's obviously an abuser and obviously has some substance issues that he can't get under control. So, after she gets rid of him, her next husband, it's interesting, it's sort of like a retroactive meeting because she actually meets this new guy a few years earlier when she's visiting London. His name is Michael, you wildin? Wilding. <laughs> Wilding was my nickname Got for him. It. He is 20 years older than Liz Taylor. Okay, so she's getting a little better. She likes a zaddy. Zaddy. Folks, for Michael Wilding, you need to imagine a British Martin Short. Oh. I think that's probably the best way of thinking of Michael Wilding in this story. Now, Michael is a respectable name in England. He's in the movies over there, but no one in America really knows him. And it seems that she married him because she wanted peace and stability with an older man, and he just wanted a leg up in the business. So it seems like he's getting involved with her because he knows that's going to make his career blossom a little bit. Something else, too. Now, this ceremony was different than <laughs> the first ceremony. 1,300 pound dress. 1,300 pound dress, because she's like, I gotta move, bitches. <laughs> she goes, I gotta, I gotta run to the divorce court after this. <laughs> Don't weigh me down. And so on February 21st, 1952, Liz Taylor and Michael Wilding get married, and here's some footage from that. All cameras at London Airport are focused on two people very much in love. Britain's Michael Wilding and his lovely young bride-to-be, Elizabeth Taylor. In the milling scrum, press photographers and newsreel men had quite a job to keep their cameras intact. Will the happy pair ever forget this day, as they share their happiness with a crowd that would have done credit to the cup final? Liz... And Michael, they have two sons together, Michael and Christopher, and it seems to many idyllic. The moviegoers are happy Liz has finally found some stability and happiness. I am. But in one of the first instances, folks, of the press overstepping its bounds in this story, Liz soon discovers some unpleasant news about her husband, Michael. Before we go any further, you might be saying, this is normal for the press to break. You think? Gossip. Well, it is and it isn't, my friend, because prior to Liz Taylor, there was a code of respect amongst reporters and their subjects. I mean, think about today, like, only after presidents die, like Roosevelt or Eisenhower or Kennedy or Johnson, did we find out that they couldn't keep it in their pants. It was because there was this code of that doesn't involve us, we're not going to get involved, right? Just like nowadays. Just like nowadays, because you know how respectful people are. But the reason we, we have this crap now is because of the stories I'm going to tell you today. So this code that they have between the reporter, between the subject, this code begins to disintegrate with gossip columnists like Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons who insinuate gossip but don't say it blatantly. So it takes the magazine Confidential. The magazine was called Confidential. And they, they were able to release something? Isn't that ironic? To just blatantly say what everyone has always been hinting at. And what they say is that is that when Liz left to go film the movie Giant, Michael was going to strip bars to pick up women. So as soon as she got on the plane and he knew the plane was in the air, he went off to a strip bar, picked up women, and had affairs with them. So this is how she finds out that her husband is not faithful to her. Oh, good. And as if this wasn't disgusting enough, the general feeling about divorce back then was that the woman had done something to trigger it. Had Liz not been such a bad wife, then Michael wouldn't need to be cheating on her. And don't believe me, you can read the tons of articles and letters that people wrote in to their newspapers to say how Liz could just be a better wife to keep Michael at home. 
They separated in 1956, and they got their official divorce in 1957. Now, she's still in her zaddy phase at age 24, and now she marries a guy who's 47 years old. Okay. His name is Avram Hirsch Goldbogen or Mike Todd. A Protestant. A Protestant. (laughs) To picture Mike Todd, I want you to picture Jack Black via his Goosebumps era. Okay. And that'll give it to you. a good era. Now, it it was the best era for Jack Black. Now, Todd was a born producer by nature. He was a gambler even when he was a kid. He wasn't even 21, and he already lost $1 million, which is $15 million in today's standards. And his magnum opus in Hollywood is his idea to create the most epic star-studded film ever made called Around the World in 80 Days. Michael Todd's Around the World. My, sorry, yes, you're right. Michael Todd's Around the World He really wanted. He really wanted days. his name on that. And this movie, folks, if you've never seen it, first of all, it's epically long. I believe your line was, it actually feels like 80 days. It actually feels like 80 days. That's how long it is. Thank you so much. And for all of this effort, he is awarded with the Best Picture. And as a token for his love for Liz, he gives her a 29.4 carrot emerald cut diamond engagement ring that's pretty nice what the fuck have you ever given me you bought me a sandwich at jack in the box once did you like it i loved it no it was 29.5 carrots <laughs> and some cucumber <laughs> exactly <laughs> and a little melted cheese now according to liz for the first time in her life it's actually love and it feels like love because mike todd's a good guy here's mike todd talking about his marriage to liz taylor I'm very fortunate and have uh, get my hands in a few dollars occasionally, and I think there's no better way in the world of spending it than trying to spoil Elizabeth. You can't, but that'd be... Uh, somebody once said, is Elizabeth spoiled? And I said, I don't know nothing more pleasant than trying to spoil her. Elizabeth doesn't think like a star or act like a star. Maybe that's why she is a star. Somebody said last night, gee, she looks beautiful. And that was the greatest misstatement. She doesn't look beautiful. She is beautiful. It's romantic. She doesn't look beautiful. She is beautiful. Isn't that sweet? And on February 2nd, 1957, Mike Todd and Liz Taylor marry a month after her divorce from you wild and becomes official in Mexico. And at the wedding, they invite Mike Todd's best friend, the singer, Eddie Fisher and Eddie Fisher's wife, Debbie Reynolds, who we probably all know from singing in the rain. Debbie Reynolds was a really good friend of Liz's as well. Cause they went to MGM together. Eddie and Debbie have a daughter, And their daughter is named Carrie, as in... Carrie, Princess Leia Organa Fisher. That is absolutely correct. And soon Liz and Michael also give birth to a baby girl named Liza. (gasps) And then Eddie and Debbie give birth to a son that they named Todd in honor of Michael. So, I mean, this is a very happy foursome. I didn't know that. Liz is happy. Eddie's happy. Debbie's happy. Michael's happy. All the kids are happy. Everyone's happy. And then they're not happy because on March 22nd, 1958... Michael Todd dies in a plane crash, a plane that he was piloting. It was a plane that he called the Liz, and she was supposed to be on the flight with him, but stayed home. This is Liz talking a little bit about finding out when how Michael Todd died. Elizabeth's third child, Liza Todd, was six months old when Mike had to fly to New York on business. Elizabeth had a virus and decided to stay home. And he came up to say goodbye to me five times, and it's like we both knew. It's like we both had a premonition. Mike Todd boarded his plane, the Liz, on March 22, 1958. It crashed in the New Mexico desert, killing everyone on board. When I got the news that morning that they didn't even get the words out, I just started screaming. How did you survive? I have no idea. I really don't know. I mean, this is incredibly crazy. tragic. I mean, here's this young, young, young woman who has gone through three marriages her husband that she loves dearly has just died. She's now a, mo- a single mother with with these kids to raise. I can't even imagine what she was going through. And on top of it, there's cameras everywhere. They photograph her leaving her house. They photograph her getting on the plane, getting off the plane. And so you have to keep that public persona up, I think, at the oh, same yeah. time, you know, 
you're going, and there's nobody to protect you. It's clear that Michael Todd was very protective of her, and now he's gone. The death of Mike Todd is not only going to be where Liz's life goes off the rails for a bit, the subsequent ways that she deals with the grief are not only going to be exploited by the press, but are going to demolish any boundaries really between the press and its subject and the public and their stars. When Mike Todd died, the new mother, Liz, understandably, is distraught. She's got nowhere to turn, as is Eddie Fisher, who just lost his best friend. So Debbie Reynolds, Fisher's wife, encourages Eddie. She said, go out, go take care of Liz. And to quote Carrie Fisher, Eddie Fisher did comfort Liz Taylor with his penis. (laughs) <laughs> because after a month, Eddie has dumped Debbie, and on May 22nd, 1959, Eddie Fisher and Liz Taylor get married, and in our film, Eddie will be played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Now, Eddie Fisher is one of those guys that you look at his wives, the beautiful Debbie Reynolds and the beautiful Elizabeth Taylor, and then you look at him and go, How? One, but two, how? So in order for you to understand the magnitude of what has just happened, of Eddie leaving Debbie for Liz, you have to think of Eddie as Brad Pitt, Jennifer Aniston as Debbie Reynolds, and Angelina Jolie as Liz Taylor. How could anyone be so horrible to wonderful Debbie Reynolds? And that's pretty much the sentiment that goes out there. Liz is branded a homewrecker, and she's spurned by a lot of the public because how could she betray Debbie? Eddie Fisher somehow isn't getting mentioned in all of this, but Eddie, Eddie Fisher does get punished. While he's popular still, it's not at the same magnitude as you know Elizabeth and Debbie. And NBC cancels his show in 1959 because they're like, you're a horrible person. And RCA Victor drops him in 1960. So you're saying that Eddie Fisher was just one of the first examples of cancel culture in Hollywood? Yes, he really was. Except for the fact he's not all that canceled all that much. Also, I should mention that Debbie Reynolds and Eddie Fisher just had a son. Like, So there's like a four-month-old baby at home (laughs) that he's abandoned as well, in addition to Carrie. But Liz, 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 Liz does not handle this well, and she's not apologetic at all. Hedda Hopper has an interview with her about this, and she, and she says to Hedda Hopper, quote, you can't break up a happy marriage. I'm not taking anything away from Debbie Reynolds because she never really had it. And then when Hopper asked Taylor, like, you know, what do you think Mike Todd would say about all this? And she says... Mike is dead and I'm alive. What do you expect me to do? Sleep alone? <laughs> so uh, she's candid. Yeah, she definitely is candid. And she is open and she is honest. It is just not helping her any in this situation. Hey, friends. Hope you're enjoying the show. If you are, could you do us a favor? After you listen to today's episode, open up your podcast app and leave us a review, please. The more reviews we get, the more people will discover us, and the more people that discover us, the less lost we'll feel. You're good, buddy. It's okay. Uh, look, nothing has ever been easier to do. Just go ahead and grab a pen real quick. It's okay. We'll wait. Don't worry. Okay. Head on over to your podcast app. Click those three dots in the lower right-hand corner. Click Go to Show. Scroll down till you see ratings and reviews, then leave us some stars and a comment or two so our parents know that it was worth all the tuition that they spent. And if you really love us, head on over to Patreon.com and send us some money, and in return, you will get access to merch, special episodes, bonus content, pictures of me shirtless. Okay, okay, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. Search This Was a Thing and help us out. But you know what? You've already helped us out today by listening to us, and we can't tell you how much we appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you. While she's still married to Eddie, Liz goes off to Italy in 1962 to star in Cleopatra, where she will play Cleopatra, the the biopic about the Queen of the Nile. Cleopatra. Cleopatra, who had one of the most sensual relationships with Mark Anthony, Mar- or Mark Anthony, not Mark Anthony, the, the singer, Mark oh, Anthony. Okay. And to play Mark Anthony will be a Welsh actor who is being heralded as the new Olivier, the greatest thing. Richard Burton, and in our version, he's going to be played by a chiseled Leonardo DiCaprio with a really sexy accent. Yeah, I was going to say Welsh Leo. Welsh Leo. Now, the first time they meet on the set of Cleopatra, he says to her, has anybody ever told you you're a very pretty girl? To which she responds, oi vey, and walks away. Well, I like that. Now, in their first deep kiss on camera, which takes place in Cleopatra's boudoir, Burton found himself quite caught up 
with Taylor, and they repeated the scene several times. His little Roman skirt. Right? Oh, my. And the kiss goes longer and longer. And then the film went $300 million over budget. <laughs> and then the director, Joseph Mankiewicz, finally shouted, print it, and they kept kissing. And he said, would you two mind if I say cut? He asked again, and they still kept going. And he said, does it interest you that it's time for lunch? Here's Liz talking about Richard Burton. In Cleopatra, when you felt that you were falling in love, was this something that you tried very hard to resist? All of that turmoil, all of that stuff that we read about? We both tried very hard to resist, but it happened on the first day of our working together. Really? Yeah. It was just like, boom. Did you feel it was inevitable? Yes. And the rest, as they say, is history. Is history. <laughs> Pretty soon, they are having a not-so-secret, but secret affair. Eddie Fisher called his home only for Burden to answer the phone. And Eddie Fisher said, what are you doing in my house? And Richard Burden said, what do you think I'm doing? I'm fucking your wife. <laughs> but now here's where it starts to get a little crazy. I said it was a secret affair, but a not-so-secret affair because a photographer iconically shoots them on a yacht together. And this is where the press says, really for the first time, there is no privacy if you're a movie star because the photo of them on their yacht was done through a telescopic lens and you're literally intruding on their personal space because before that, reporters didn't really cross that barrier. What you did in your own home or in your own territory was your business. And now the press is saying, every, we, we want to get a, we want to catch them having an affair. We will intrude their private space to get the photographs that we need. And this is what breaks down the barrier. Okay, so this is all because of Liz and Dick. Now, the Vatican gets involved, and they say that the relationship between Burden and Taylor is, quote, erotic vagrancy. Meanwhile, how are your priests doing? And then there's calls from the United States, like people were actually calling and sending letters to the president saying, you have to ban them from entering the country. They're horrible people. So uh, it's, I mean, it's horrible. I mean, Fisher tried to commit suicide. Richard Burden's wife, Sybil, tried to commit suicide. Liz Taylor tried to kill herself twice during Cleopatra. So finally, on March 5th, 1964, she finally gets a divorce from Fisher. And 10 days later, she marries Richard Burden in Mexico. And with that, we officially now have Liz and Dick, or Dick and Liz, as the tabloids she like to call them. She loves getting married in Mexico. Because you get the quickie divorces down there. Oh, that's true. And it was quick down there. Later on, Eddie Fisher, who I think is a schmuck, he gets his comeuppance because Debbie and Liz reconcile. Perfect. And later on, Liz says, I married him because I was in grief. And people were furious at Debbie Reynolds for forgiving Liz Taylor. And Liz felt horrible and apparently said to Debbie Reynolds, I'm so sorry for what I did to you with Eddie. I just feel so awful when I think of how I hurt you and your children. Here's Debbie Reynolds talking a little bit about what went on. She loved life. You know, Elizabeth loved life. And I know because she <laughs> took part of mine. And, uh, <laughs> She's the best. <laughs> that wasn't true, Debbie. Was this? <laughs> I'm completely over it. There's, a, no, but there's more than fun adjusting stuff to the story. That's, no, yes. no, no. With your, I just, you know, you have to f forget it. You have to forgive it. Yeah. And but then it doesn't mean you forget it. She and so was truly, saying. when you guys said, let's get over this and be friends again, you really right. meant, I, you know, do you miss that friendship? Yeah. Well, I always miss a real true friendship. And when you're young girls in school and you kind of grow up together, you know, why should it be broken up by a man that uh, doesn't really matter in the end, you know, but you don't know that in the beginning. Right. So it's kind of a contest, isn't it? Yeah. Life is uh, not a bowl of cherries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Debbie was very forgiving of, of Liz Taylor. Life is not a bowl of cherries. It's a card table full of shit. <laughs> Brought me that. Back to Dick and Liz. So over the next few years, the crowds would only grow larger, eager to see them as they jet set it around the world. And Liz and Dick, Dick and Liz, both uh, despised and reveled in this attention. Now, together, they make 11 films. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? The Taming of the Shrew? Probably the big, the big ones. And their spending and fights are all the public wants to talk about. And Dick and Liz do not disappoint. I think she holds a record of being on magazines, on the front cover of magazines, more than any other individual. They were both spenders. Burden, he used a $1.25 million check as a bookmark. And he once bought a $960,000 jet plane on a whim. 
They just randomly bought property all over the world. They owned a floating luxury palace, which was their yacht, and many original paintings by so many great artists. But as time goes on, Liz enjoys her rich folks and her rich things, and Richard Burton is like, I'm kind of bored with all of this. They have horrible fights, mostly in public, and always like on a sense of the performative. She'll call him untalented. He'll call her ugly. Here's Liz talking a little bit more about what her relationship with Richard Burton was like. I think we were so passionately in love with each other. It was almost like everything was too much. We loved each other almost too much. It sounds silly. No, it doesn't. But it was so intense that it was almost abnormal. But it was... It was great. The fights sadly became more brutal, and alcohol fueled it for him, pills fueled it for her, and she was constantly discovering him with other women. And then in June of 1974, they divorced, and the tabloids were all over the fact that Dick and Liz broke up, and only a year later, she decides to get married again. Not a lot of recovery time. Nope. And this time, she is marrying Richard Burton. They got remarried. Oh, well, at least it was easy for her. Yeah, it was an easy one for her. And sadly, they divorced again a year later oh. in 1976. I know. And she says, I don't want to be that much in love ever again. I gave everything away, my soul, my being, everything. Because it was so clear that they still, she loved him and he loved her. And they just had so many substance abuse issues and so many issues in trying to find common ground with one another that it just never allowed the love really to blossom. So we flash forward to 1984 and Richard Burden knows that he's dying and the and he was married at this time and he had kids and all that. And the last thing he did was he wrote a letter to Liz and this letter arrived at her house after she came back from his funeral services. Oh, shit. And it was a love letter to her. And in it, he told her what he had wanted, which was, home is where you are, and I want to come home. And then he died. So it's clear that this this love uh, never left them, even though they stopped being married to one another. So now... She divorces Richard Burden in June of 76, and in December of 1976, she marries the new husband. The new husband is not at all involved in show business. He's a former secretary of the Navy, a Republican, named John Warner. And in this one, folks, he's going to be played by an aggressive Leslie Nielsen. This is nuts Leslie Nielsen, not Naked Gun Leslie Nielsen. And Liz would say after Richard, the men in my life were just there to hold the coat, open the doors, and all the men after Richard were really just company. And so John Warner, I'm so sorry, your company. And he runs for the Republican nomination for the Virginia Senate seat. He loses it, but the guy that ended up getting the nomination, he died in a plane crash. And so Warner gets bumped up and now Warner and Liz are going to hit the campaign trail together. Oh, perfect. Now, the press went from chastising Liz, right? Like how dare you, you're a horrible person with Debbie Reynolds to now they're going to just be laughing at Liz because there was a series of mishaps such as the well-known choking on a chicken bone incident on the campaign trail. And if you're an SNL fan, you'll remember the sketch where Bill Murray is interviewing John Belushi dressed like Liz Taylor and she's choking on a chicken bone. (laughs) She fell on the ice and she broke her finger. She twisted her ankle on the way to a campaign dinner. She was treated for an injury when a sliver of metal became lodged under her eyelid while she was eating pizza in Richmond, Virginia. What the fuck? So it's one mishap after another. But she win- Warner wins the Senate seat, and Liz decides to move to Washington, D.C. to be the politician's wife. Here's Liz talking about life with Senator John Warner. I think Washington for women is a desperately lonely city, uh, especially if you've been active all your life. Because if you're a politician's wife and don't have your own role, there's nothing for you to do except be supportive. And sometimes I didn't agree with all the issues. So, you know, I really had to kind of keep my mouth shut. In the end, the marriage didn't work. So, like she's saying at this time, you know, she's used to this Hollywood lifestyle and Hollywood people and she's isolated. So she begins to drink more and uh, take more pills and suffer from depression. And she puts on a lot of weight. And this is uh, just the fat shaming of her is 
out of control. All anyone wants to do is get a picture of Liz being fat, of Liz eating, of Liz looking awkward. And she's a punchline just about on every single late night talk show, every single night in monologues, every single comedy thing was making fun of Liz Taylor's weight. Now, the press just want to eat Liz alive. And she is not going to give them the satisfaction. She would go out, and when she went out, she would try to avoid eating so they couldn't take pictures of her eating. And when people would try to fat shame her in interviews, she would say, you know, someone told me that Debbie Reynolds kept a photograph of me taken at my fattest period on her refrigerator door. She said it reminded her of what could happen if she charged into the icebox. During the initial stage of my diet, I thought, well... If it works for Debbie, maybe it'll work for me. If you think a picture of me as Miss Lard will inspire you, go ahead and put it on your refrigerator. I have no objection. So she could have easily crumbled and cried. And she said, I'm just, I'm going to take it and I'm going to laugh it off, which is not easy to do. But now here's a woman who in every phase of her life, grief, love, a time when her body is changing, is consistently being mocked and ridiculed. And she just has to roll with it and keep a positive attitude. Now, eventually, Liz starts to realize how unhappy she is, and she and Warner separate in 1981. They divorce in 82. And at this time, she begins to try branching out. She appears in two Broadway plays. Oh. One very successfully, The Little Foxes, and in one that was god-awful but sold a lot of tickets, she and Richard Burden reunited to do a play called Private Lives by the great Noel Coward. And then finally, the years of abuse uh, pill addiction have taken their toll on Liz and she checks into the Betty Ford Center in 1988 and while she's there she meets a construction worker and she says what are you in here for and he says beer they're 20 years apart his name is Larry Fortensky and in our movie he's going to be played by uh, Jesse Plemons okay. and Larry is a, a total change of pace and a breath of fresh air for her and the tabloids have a field day ridiculing her one for going with someone who's so young Fuck it. And they didn't have a problem when all the guys were doing it earlier. Oh, yeah. And uh, someone who's, she's she's going beneath her station. And Liz doesn't give two fucks, and she marries him on October 6, 1991, at the home of her very good friend. Debbie Reynolds. Michael Jackson. Oh. Who loved Liz. And it is rumored he even got surgery to look like Liz. The wedding itself was rumored to cost between $1.5 and $2 million. And the guests, the guests at this wedding, are you ready? Liza Minnelli, Eddie Murphy, Arsenio Hall, Nancy Reagan, Quincy Jones, Carol Bayer Sager uh, was the maid of honor, and uh, Jose Eber, uh, Liz's hairdresser, was Larry's best man. Perfect. People really, really wanted to get into this wedding, and they couldn't, so helicopters flew overhead. And one photographer was uh, very audacious. He parachuted down from a helicopter into the wedding to snap photographs of the couple and luckily the police were able to escort him off now this is where i'm also like liz taylor you fucking badass she was one of the first celebrities to say that aids was a problem and aids needed to be looked at so she sold the photographs from her own wedding to people magazine for one million dollars and she used that money to start up her oh, foundation wow. for aids research how cool is that now there does not seem to have been an engagement ring because everyone was like what's the ring look like what's the ring look like liz has plenty of engagement ring she didn't need another one but she wore a diamond eternity band on her left hand for the duration of their marriage and unlike the other husbands it seems larry's focus is liz he's not a gold digger he doesn't want to be an actor, and he even kept working in construction oh, wow. after they got married together. And eventually, she's like, I want to spend time with you, so she made him quit so that they could travel the world together. Probably not the best thing, because he liked being a construction worker and liked being outdoors. And sadly, in the mid-80s, she starts to get sick, and then they, they're in separate beds together, and she says that was like... Ulti like the ultimate undoing was the fact that we were just starting to sleep in separate beds. And she came to him, and she said, look, I'm unhappy. I know you're unhappy. And I don't want us to end up hating each other. She's like, so let's just wow. get a divorce. And in 1996, they split up. And here she is talking about Larry Fortensky. Larry is a very sweet, kind, funny man. And I was so proud when he kept on working as a construction worker. And he had his own sense of self. And then it just all started to change. And it got all blurred. And I think my hip surgeries were very hard on him. He just really couldn't kind of cope with it. As you tell me this, you're blaming yourself. Because I don't want to blame him. We just stopped communicating. 
when they split up, Larry immediately goes back to his old life. And they did, however, speak on the phone a couple of times a month. They remained friends until after she died. And he had just spoken to her the day before she went into the hospital for the last time. And he found out that she died by watching television. Oh, wow. So once again, the press. Yeah, I was going to say it all. Yeah. <laughs> and so from 1996 forward, Liz Taylor really didn't work as much and she didn't remarry. Her life was quiet and it was clear as time went on that she seemed to age faster than most. The tabloids, still obsessed with her and still knowing that she would sell rags, always featured her looking sickly on the cover, announcing her imminent death. This is the year Liz Taylor dies. Two weeks left. Eventually, they were right. And she died in 2011 at the age of 79. In 79 years, the decorum and decency that the press had towards its subjects had eroded. In just 79 years, the readers saw photos of mugshots, autopsy reports, spouses discussing their partners' infidelities at the same time the public was finding out, and the children of celebrities like being demonized by the press. In fact, it seems now that the access to a celebrity is the right of the audience, and when the celebrity tries to put up a wall, the public gets indignant. So every time we see a celebrity's leaked nude, or we laugh at their drunken exploits in private, or tweet our thoughts on their relationships, whether we are conscious of it or not, the roots of our actions can all be traced back to the many loves and husbands of Elizabeth Taylor. Okay. And we're going to talk more about Liz when we come back. This was a thing, this was a thing. And now, this is a sketch. You remember Liz Taylor's White Diamonds, a fragrance that brought luck to millions of women and men around the world. These have always brought me luck. Don't forget her fragrance before that, Passion. Passion, I see, is catching. I sure hope so. Well, now Liz is back with a new fragrance to bring even more luck and bring you what's rightfully yours. Alimony. Trust me, if there's something that I know a thing or two about, it's alimony. She's not wrong. Just ask any of her seven ex-husbands. Seven ex-husbands, but eight marriages. You do the math. That's right. Richard Dick Burton got the shaft twice, folks. I promise you, I loved them all. Well, maybe six of the seven at least. Maybe five. I definitely felt something for five of them. This isn't acting. This is Liz Taylor presenting her new fragrance. Alimony. How do you think I have such a passion for white diamonds? Thank you. This was a sketch. So here are our thoughts. As you can tell, yes, we've had a lot of laughs with Liz, but hopefully we're not laughing at Liz because I feel it's that this brilliant actress, and she was a brilliant actress. And she had a good sense of humor. And she had a great sense of humor. I, I, I'm hoping that we can see that the way she handled the press and the way that she handled all of the, she was the guinea pig for all of this stuff. Absolutely. So what? why do we talk about her? Why was this a thing? Well, first of all, Liz and Dick, whether they wanted to or not, showed us that celebrities don't have a right to privacy. They, do, I think they do, but the press was like, they don't, and we're going to use Liz and Dick as the example. She's synonymous with lots of marriages and bad relationships. I mean, anytime somebody gets re- divorced and remarried over and over again, they're like, oh, you know, Liz Taylor, Liz Taylor, Liz Taylor. And she really is like the first modern celebrity because, yes, she's part of the studio system, but she's able to exist within the studio system and play by her own rules, which is the countless marriages. And there's really no attempt by the studio to sort of like dissuade her from doing it. It's almost like she was probably the first female or the first female to like break out of the studio system where like men had a lot more sway absolutely like she probably was the first one where she could break the rules and she was more popular than the studio itself i'm so happy that you said that because i feel like she upended the studio system of decorum of this idea of like you have to say this or you don't say that and she always said how she felt now you might when she says listen i didn't take eddie fisher away from debbie reynolds because she never had him to begin with you might go oh that's so fucking harsh but it's her truth. Yeah, she's not bullshitting. She just no, says what's on her mind. No, and she really was a role model for for women, I think, who say, I'm going to leave this marriage when I feel it's not giving me anything, Yeah, which was an anomaly at the time. And I know that there's a lot of people who ended up leaving their spouses at this time, women who said, I was empowered by watching Liz Taylor go, this isn't doing it for me anymore. 
I'm out of here. So we can thank her for that. And she was one of the first really to make her personal life as important as her professional life in terms of her stardom. She was outspoken as a woman. She really propagated the idea of an entertainer as an activist with all of her work on on AIDS research. And it's so funny because I think now a lot of couples seek out fame on social media. Do you know what I mean? Oh, my God. The number of couples that we could mention. And she ran away from it. So it, to, for her to be like, really, you're throwing your, I would love to see her on social media and be like, really, you're, you're throwing yourself in front of the cameras? I'm running away from it. You made a separate couples account? Right. And so to leave us, to leave us before we get into our, our game, here's Liz on the Johnny Carson show talking a little bit about. All right. Love. Nobody likes to have a marriage that does not work, right? Yeah. Nobody yeah, likes that. And, and I've often made jokes about mine because I think sometimes by doing that. And mine that, too. Yes, I have. <laughs> That's absolutely true, but I think you do that to kind of keep the hurt away, and you make jokes about it. Now, when it comes to the, if marriage was a giant slalom, I mean, I'm a, I'm a bronze medal winner. <laughs> You're a gold medal winner, right? I mean, I put it that way. Uh, what makes this one seem like it's going to work? Well, uh, I never thought I'd get married again. I wasn't married for 11 years, which for me is history making. Oh. And uh, I think the circumstances under which we met, you know, to go through therapy together at Betty Ford, you get to know each other really well. Right. I mean, there are no secrets. Right. And we give each other great support in our sobriety, and there is a kind of closeness that is like nothing show businessy. It's very private right. and very profound. Okay, come on. She is so charming and so funny. And like I said, I think that she was a brilliant actress who doesn't get the credit that she deserves because people were so obsessed with her beauty. And I think people will lose how much change she impacted because they're so focused on all of the crazy quote unquote relationships that she went through. So Liz, I'm so sorry. I'm sure she loved herself by the end. Yes. And at the end of the day, that's the most important marriage. And she had good luck at the end. It always brought me luck. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you want to play a game? Sure. This was a thing and now it's a quiz. This is a this was a quiz. With Mark Schroeder. Hey, Mark. Yes, Rob. We're going to flip the tables. I wasn't told about this. And Ray, you're going to participate too. Because I was the one presenting. So I'm going to see how much you remembered from what I said. <gasps> Liz Taylor had seven husbands. Mm. Here's some trivia about each of her husbands. I'm going to send it to you first, Mr. Schroeder. Okay. Nikki Hilton fucked his stepmother. Who was his stepmother? And she's famous. Ooh, okay. Got to be a little bit older. A Hilton stepmother. I'm going to say it was Shelley Winters. Zsa Zsa Gabor. Zsa Zsa Gabor. Oh, that's right. Ray, I'm sending it to you because you remember the husband's names. Gossip columnist Hedda Hopper said not to marry this husband because he was, quote, queer, end quote, after it was discovered he had slept with Noel Coward. Which one of her seven men was this? Eddie Fisher. Michael Wilding. Oh, Michael Wilding. I'm sending it over to Mark. Receiving. Her last husband, Larry Fortensky. When he was arrested in the 1990s for drunk driving, what did police discover in his saddlebag? He had a saddlebag. Mm -hmm. What did they discover in it? Anal beads. Final answer. Yes. A loaded 9 millimeter semi-automatic. Oh, my God. God, that took a turn. All right, Ray, I'm sending it to you. You have to give me the husband's name. Are you ready? She ended phone conversations with this husband. Quote, hey, man, till we talk again. Richard Burton? John Warner. Senator John Warner. <laughs> hey, man. Hey, I'm sending it back to you now, Mark. This husband was rumored to have slept with Laurence Olivier. Richard Burton? Good. Point for Mark. You no, know, backstage. I get it. Back to you, Ray. Ready? This quote is attributed to which one of her husbands? Quote, I get an A plus in poor judgment. Eddie Fisher. Hey, nicely done. Mark, last question. I'm ready. Now we're tied. It's going to be a tiebreaker, this one. One of his jobs was, quote, hospital security guard and to stop visitors from bringing in food 
that was not on the patient's diet. Bubbles the monkey. They were just engaged. They never got ah, married. Ray? Larry Portensky. No! Oh. It's the one we haven't mentioned that you know everything about. Oh, is it Michael... Uh, Todd. Todd? It's Mike Todd. Really? I didn't know I didn't know it was that deep. Wow. Well, you. Bo- I think you both did great. Thanks. So, hope you enjoyed this episode on Liz Taylor and her many... Hu- really, it's about her husbands. It's a celebration of her husbands and all of the wonderful men that came through Liz Taylor's life. If you have a favorite husband, hit us up. We'd love to hear from you. Even if it's not Liz Taylor's no. husband. No, and she probably married them. So if yeah. you have a 50-50 chance on all of these. We'll see you all next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to This Was a Thing, and a big thanks to the folks that keep this show running. Our editor, Daniel Cut Cut Schwartzberg, our composer, Billy Better Than DC Reese, our social media director, Gabe Hashtag Crawford, our graphic designer, Natalie's Nothing Too Graphic De Savia, and finally, our games coordinator, Mark the Shark Schroeder. If you liked what we did today, make sure to head on over to iTunes to rate and review us. The more stars you leave us, the more love we feel. Hey, speaking of love, show us some social media love. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at This Was A Thing Pod and Facebook we are This Was A Thing Podcast. Reach out. We'd love to hear from you. And if you really liked what we did today, head on over to Patreon.com and become one of our sponsors and you'll get access to special episodes, interviews, and merch. That's Patreon. Search This Was A Thing and support us so we can keep doing this show. 